It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Dr. Peter Hurst, Associate Dean, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Dr. Hurst, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to the latest in our Innovation at Work webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Greetings to you all, uh, wherever you may be in the world, from here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm delighted to be sitting here uh, today with uh, Dr. David Simpi-Levy, uh, who is going to be talking with us about the new frontier in price optimization. Uh, the webinar uh, series is intended to bring uh, to you all around the world some of our leading uh, faculty who participate in MIT Sloan's executive education uh, programs. Uh, and I'm delighted today that over 1,400 people around the world have registered uh, to participate in this uh, webinar with Dr. David Simpi-Levy. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward very much to uh, both uh, hearing uh, from uh, the, our presenter about uh, the ideas he's talking about today and then making this an interactive uh, session as well. So please feel free as you go through listening to the presentation to ask any questions. Later on, I'll uh, be turning those into an interview session uh, and we'll follow up also with a Facebook interview uh, as well. So with that, I'd like to hand over uh, the mic to uh, Dr. David Simke-Levy. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm going to uh, talk uh, today about new opportunities uh, in price uh, optimization. This is work uh, and experience that we have gained um, over the last uh, four years. Um, I will focus uh, in my discussion um, on online uh, retailing, on the online retail industry, but the concept, the ideas, the impact uh, are more than just uh, the focus that I have here on online uh, retailing, it will help us illustrate some of this concept and how companies can uh, uh, use them to make a big uh, impact on bottom line. Uh, the online uh, retail uh, industry has been growing um, at a rate of about 10% over the last uh, few years. Last year it was uh, about a $300 billion industry, and this number does not include um, online sales of brick and mortar companies like uh, uh, Walmart. Uh, there are on the screen uh, a few uh, examples. I will focus uh, specifically on three. Groupon, uh, many people are familiar with. Uh, Rulala, I'll talk about who Rulala is and what uh, work we have done with Rulala. And a large, uh, the largest, in fact, online retailer in uh, Latin America called B2W. All these companies have additional information compared to brick and mortar retailers. They have information on, on customers making um, decisions in real time, buy no buy decisions. And the question we are going to ask, can we use this information in real time to improve uh, performance, to improve revenue, to impact profit, uh, and perhaps to impact uh, even market share? Um, I will focus in this presentation on uh, three stories. The first is the rule of last story where we focused on forecasting and price optimization. When I talk about forecasting, I talk about how do you generate an effective forecast um, for product you never sold before and how can you use it to optimize uh, price. The second story will be the story of Groupon. Here, um, the opportunity was how can we learn during the selling season about consumer preference, change our forecast based on what we learn, and improve our pricing strategy. And the third story is the B2W story where I will combine all these concepts to have an effective uh, pricing strategy. I will bring together forecasting, how do I generate the initial forecast, Learning, how do I observe consumer response and change my forecast and therefore change my price? And how do I incorporate this into uh, an effective uh, strategy? And then I will conclude with a few uh, observations. Let me just emphasize the three concepts that I will highlight. Forecasting, generating the initial uh, forecast for product I never sold before. Learning, 
can I learn on the fly observing consumer respond to different offers? And how can I incorporate all this learning and forecasting into an effective uh, price optimization uh, strategy? And so let me start with the Rulala uh, story. Uh, Rulala uh, is in the flash cell uh, industry. Uh, they sell um, during short events, typically 48 hours, a product at a very deep uh, discount. This industry started in the mid-2000s. It is growing now at a rate of about 17% per year, um, uh, which is faster than um, the uh, typical online uh, retail uh, companies. Uh, there are um, a few competitors in this space. Rulala is one. It's based in Boston. Zulili is based in Seattle. Gilt, uh, the company was recently acquired. Uh, Gilt is based in New York. Uh, there is um, a flash cell uh, company in uh, Spain. There is a very successful one in China. So you get a sense of a very competitive um, space. If you go today on Rulala website, you will see that there are a number of events going on in parallel. If you look at the top left-hand side, you will see, for example, an event where they are selling classical watches. Uh, you see another event where they sell perhaps jewelry. Uh, two events where they sell running shoes on the right-hand side, men running shoes on the left-hand side, uh, women running shoes. Uh, and uh, each event will emphasize how much time is left until the event is closed. And of course, the idea is to generate a sense of urgency. If you are interested in a specific product, perhaps the women running shoes, you click on that event, and you will see the available, uh, you will see the available styles. In this case, I have three styles. And you notice that for each style, the website emphasizes the Rulala price for that uh, style. Um, on the left-hand side of the price, you can see uh, a number uh, erased, and this number, this price, is the recommended price by the manufacturer, and you get a sense a deep discount provided by, uh, by Rulala, again, to motivate a decision very quickly. If you are interested in uh, one of the styles, you click on the style, and you see um, the uh, different sizes that are available, and then uh, the customer make a buy, no buy uh, decision. Right. Um, operation for flash cell companies uh, is very simple. All of them have the same structure. At some point, the merchant will decide what uh, items to buy, uh, in the case of Ulala, from fashion designers. Example will be uh, Ralph Lauren. Example will be Louis Vuitton. Uh, the items will arrive at their warehouse. And then the merchant needs to decide when to sell the product what event to use, and at what price. Typically, the strategy before um, we, our collaboration with Rulala, the strategy is cost plus, right? They know what the cost is, they focus on the margin, and a very simple way to implement a pricing strategy. And so now uh, the merchant decide, uh, decided which event to use to sell the product. This is the first time the product uh, is sold. It's uh, on the website for 48 hours. If all the inventory is sold, that's great. But if there is leftover inventory, then this inventory stays on their, uh, at their warehouse for seven, eight, nine months until the next time they can sell the product. And the reason they have to wait is because the uh, designer, the manufacturer, does not want their product to be discounted too frequently. As a result, it's very important to optimize performance during first event, during first exposure of the product. But this is the most difficult uh, challenge because I never sold this product before. I don't have historical data about this product. Uh, how can I make effective decisions? So let's see uh, how they uh, perform before uh, our collaboration. And I have here data from Rulala from five different departments. On the X coordinate, I'm presenting what, I, what uh, we call sell-through. What is sell-through? 
Thersu is a percentage of inventory sold during the first exposure, during the first event. So, for instance, when I show on the right-hand side sold out, it means we sold the entire inventory during the first exposure. When this shows 25 to 50 percent, it means we sold in this range during first exposure. And on the left-hand side, on the uh, Y coordinate, I uh, uh, present information about the frequency that we achieve that level of sales through. So let's take an example. Consider Department 5, right? That's the um, light blue uh, color. And if you look at the bar on the right-hand side, it suggests that, uh, and let me point out, it suggests that in 62% uh, of the cases, the company sold out for department, uh, for department uh, one. This may suggest that we are not having the right strategy. What you want is to sell everything but one unit, right? Because if you sold everything but one unit, you know nothing is left, no money is left on the table. So this may suggest that the price may have been too low and there is an opportunity to increase the price. It's not clear, but at least uh, we need to consider. On the left-hand side, you see the reverse problem. Think about the um, red bar on the left-hand side. It's associated with Department 2. This data suggests that for Department 2, in 22% of the cases, the company did not sell anything or very little. This may suggest that for this product, price may have been just too high. And now, um, the challenge is how do I price this product effectively to maximize um, revenue and hopefully uh, profit and finally um, uh, market share, right? And so uh, just a little bit about the way we engaged in Rulala. We started when Rulala engaged us in a discussion about inventory, but looking at the data, the data tells a story. It's nothing to do with inventory. This really has to do with effective uh, pricing strategy. But the question that the company asked, um, what do you know uh, that will allow us to improve our pricing strategy? And so we develop a two-step process. The first step is generating an effective demand forecast. And the second step is um, focused on uh, price optimization, right? Using the demand forecast to uh, optimize price effectively. Now, when you um, hear me talking about two steps, demand forecast and price optimization, you tell yourself, yeah, makes sense. There is nothing surprising here. You, you may argue even that that's what you are doing. What I want to uh, illustrate here that um, what we are talking about in terms of demand forecast and price optimization is a little bit different than what you see done in, in practice. And so let's start with the demand forecast. When you focus on the demand forecast, there are two important challenges. The first is I'm looking to, I'm trying to forecast demand for a product I never sold before. I have no uh, historical data about the performance of this uh, product. That's the first challenge. The second challenge uh, is a little bit, uh, uh, we need a little bit more a careful analysis of their data, but the challenge is that for a lot of their product, the companies stock out. When the companies stock out, the only information that I have is information about sales, not about demand. But I'm trying to focus demand, and so how can I reverse engineer from information about sales to information about market demand for a specific uh, product? And so um, a little bit illustrating what we have done, um, we use machine learning techniques to, um, tr to reverse engineer information about sales into information about uh, market demand. And the way uh, we did it, we looked at all the products that did not stock out and we learned from them about the demand for the product that did stock, uh, did stock out. And now that we have information about market demand for different uh, products, um, we combine in developing the forecasting model internal data that Ulala has together with external data that we got uh, from other uh, sources. And you will see when I talk about uh, data analytics in general, that's really what I will focus on. How can we combine internal, what you have in your own organization, with external 
that allows you to uh, improve uh, focus accuracy. So focusing on, on um, uh, rule of uh, we had different types of data. For example, um, um, data about the product department, think about women shoes, a class, women running shoes, the distribution of colors, color popularity, the distribution of sizes, and external data like the popularity of different brands. Then we had information, internal information about price, about discount relative to the recommended price by the manufacturer, all the competing styles that Rulala is selling in parallel to the product I'm focusing on because they will have an impact on demand for the specific product because they are all competing in the same space. And of course, information about the event itself. When is it uh, done? Year, uh, uh, months, week, and even um, uh, when is the starting uh, hour of, of the event? And so we combine all this data, the internal plus the external data, and we tested many different uh, forecasting techniques. And what came out is that the most effective way to forecast customer demand for a new product is what I call here um, regression trees, right? So uh, regression trees are not commonly used um, in industry when you think about forecast forecasting techniques that companies uh, are using, typically you are talking about linear regression. So what are regression trees? Regression trees are a collection of rules that if you follow them, at the end it will tell you a story about market demand following that set of rules. Let's look at the examples that I have um, on, on the screen. Um, if you start at the top, what this says, we are trying to predict demand for a specific uh, product. Um, the first rule that we need to test is about the price of this product. What the uh, rule says, if the price of this product is less than 100, you need to move to the left, otherwise we move to the right. Suppose the price that we are considering is below 100. And so we move to the left. And now we see a second uh, rule. And this rule compares the price of this product we are considering uh, to the average price of all competing products. If the ratio between the two, if the ratio between the price of the product that we are considering uh, and the average price of all competing product is below 0.8, then I move again to the left, and this says the demand um, prediction is 50 units. And so you can see that regression trees are not about an equation. If these are a set of rules, or think about this like a collection of stories. If you follow the story in one direction, it gives you the demand prediction. If you follow it in a different direction, it gives you a different prediction um, um, for customer demand. So you ask yourself immediately, why regression tree? Why this came out to be so effective? There are two reasons uh, for that. The first reason is, unlike other methods, unlike, for example, linear regression, uh, in regression tree, I can look at a new style and identify similar styles that I sold before that have similar characteristics, the same characteristic as the new style I'm focusing on. And so every time I have a new style, the regression tree will identify the subset of styles I sold before that behave in the same way as my new style. As a result, I can use those historical styles to predict customer demand for the new product. The second um, observation about regression tree is related to price-demand relationship. Um, in the case of uh, Rula La, for a lot of fashion product, uh, price-demand relationship is non-monotonic. By this, I mean the following. Price for uh, fashion products that come from companies like Ralph Lauren or Louis Vuitton uh, is, an is an indication of quality, is an indication of brand. As a result, for lots of products, the higher the price, the higher the demand, and if you use some simple uh, linear regression, they, are not, they don't allow this type of, of uh, relationship. Uh, 
And so once we uh, develop um, the regression tree and the demand forecast, the next question was um, how can we use it effectively as part of uh, uh, a price optimization uh, process? When you do the price optimization, um, you realize very quickly that you have two challenges. The first challenge, if I, I try to price the, um, a specific product, the demand for that product depends on its price, as well as the price of all products that compete with the ones that I'm trying to price right now, right? Because a higher uh, price for uh, some of the competing products will typically move some demand to our product or will change the demand to our product. And so I need to price all these competing products at the same time. That's the first challenge. The second challenge that I have to consider is I don't have a simple function representing the relationship between uh, demand and price. I have a set of stories. I have these trees that give me a good prediction, but how do I incorporate them into a price optimization uh, technique. And that what, uh, was uh, a part of the work that um, we have done with Rulala. And once we developed the optimization model, we integrated our technology as part of the, uh, inf the IT infrastructure that Rulala has. If you look um, at, at this slide uh, where my uh, pointer is you can see uh, Rulala uh, ERP. Every uh, night our uh, system takes uh, data from uh, Rulala um, ERP uh, and bring it to what we call the optimizer database. This data in the optimizer database is used by a collection of statistical tools. Um, we use R to uh, generate the regression tree. Um, at some point, we incorporate inventory information um, into the regression tree, and the final set of regression trees are transferred into the optimization model. Um, after typically 45 minutes to an hour, the optimization uh, model spit out um, prices for thousands and thousands of different uh, products. When the merchant arrives in the morning, they look at the uh, recommended price by our uh, technology. Um, each merchant is looking at their own uh, product. Um, our experience uh, was that they typically approve 95, 97% of the uh, prices recommended by our technology. The ones that they did, do not approve, um, we, we found, are those products that uh, the merchant found there is another uh, competitor who is selling the product at a lower price, and for some product category, uh, Rulala wants to be the lowest retailer in, in the market. And so in this case, they will override uh, the recommendation by our technology. And so uh, we uh, did a lot of um, offline analysis on trying to um, estimate the impact of our uh, technology. Um, and we were at the beginning of 2014 ready for a field experiment that lasted many months. Um, there were two objectives for the field experiment. The first one is what we all think about, right? What is the impact on revenue, right? Everybody is trying to implement um, a pricing strategy so that you will make a big impact on bottom line. That's clear. But there was a second uh, objective. The second objective is not only focus on uh, impact on revenue, but also uh, make sure that there is no decrease in, uh, in, in market share, right? Nobody wants to uh, see an algorithm that increase revenue but decrease uh, market share. And so what we did was um, identified 6,000 styles where the tool recommended uh, price increase, and that's where you are worried about uh, an impact on market share. We divided these uh, 6,000 styles into five categories based on uh, price point, right? Uh, for each uh, category, and each category had uh, hundreds of products, we split them into uh, two. Um, one half of the uh, styles 
um, we were used as a control group. This is where um, Rulala is using the cost plus to price the product, and the other one, our algorithm generate prices. This is the treatment group. And the question was, uh, first, what is the impact on market share? We uh, use sell-through to uh, estimate the impact of, on market share. You can see on the Y coordinate here, um, average sell-through in our experiment, and on the X coordinate, the five different pod, uh, categories from A to E, arranged by, according to price point, uh, where category E is the lowest price point and category, category A is the lowest price point and category E is the highest price point. Red represents the performance of uh, the treatment group, that's our algorithm. Blue represents the control, that's uh, Rulala using cost plus. And you can see that uh, for category B, C, D, and E, there was really no impact on sales through, on market share, despite the fact that we increased the price. There was a problem in uh, category A. As we increased the price, you can see that uh, sales through goes down, and so we needed to uh, uh, change our strategy for category A. I'll talk about this in a second. Now you ask yourself, what is the impact on revenue? Um, here it is. Uh, you can see that for category B, we increase revenue by about 11%, for C by 11%, for D by about 13%, and for E by around 22%. We had a problem, uh, as I mentioned, for category A. And what we found, category A uh, is a category of product where the pr average price is about 50 bucks. Um, our algorithm uh, increased the price too much. We put a constraint that the increase in price cannot be more than $5, and that solves the problem. Overall, our algorithm and, and think about what I'm saying. This is MIT developing algorithm that is running uh, online, increased revenue for Rulala by 10, uh, by an average of 10 or 11 percent. And so uh, now that we did this, uh, we started talking to a group on that was interested in uh, using similar technology uh, to improve their pricing uh, strategy. Let me talk just a little bit about, uh, about Groupon. It's one of the largest uh, um, um, online e-marketplace, uh, in fact, that you see uh, today. They operate in more than 600 cities. They have about 50 million customers. They sell thousands of uh, deals, every, new deals every day. Very difficult to predict customer demand. In fact, just generating the initial uh, forecast like we did for Ulala is extremely challenging for um, for uh, Groupon. They have a lot of data, but they were not using the data to adjust price. Product life cycle is relatively short, and by this I mean the following: product, uh, a new deal stays on their website for four days. Uh, at the end of day number four, the deal is moved to a secondary page. You can find it, but it takes more effort. As a result, it's important to optimize performance during the first four days. And that was uh, our focus. And so when I talk here, in the case of uh, Groupon, about online revenue management, I um, refer to online in two ways. First, online retailing, many products high demand uncertainty, short product life cycle, I have a lot of data, and I can quickly change price. The second uh, interpretation of online is online learning. That is, can I learn on the fly about uh, consumer preference and change my uh, pricing uh, strategy? And this is described nicely in this uh, slide. And the idea is very simple. Think about the four days where uh, Groupon is trying to optimize performance for a new deal. If I learn for a long period of time, I will have a good understanding of customer demand, but I don't have enough time to optimize. And the reverse is also true. If I learn for a short period of time, maybe for one hour, then I will have an approximate understanding of customer demand, but I have a lot of time to optimize. So what is the right trade-off between learning and earning is an important question that one needs to answer. Uh, we knew it's very difficult to generate the initial forecast. For ev so for every uh, new deal, we develop an algorithm that generates for a new deal M demand functions, say 30 demand functions. 
What is the main function uh, I? The main function I is just the probability that the customer will purchase the product at, uh, uh, at price, uh, at a specific price uh, P. And so we are, for every new deal, we generate um, a number of demand functions, say 30 uh, demand functions. Um, all these demand functions will be used, but we don't know which one correctly represent um, consumer behavior. And so we are going to use learning to determine which one of the demand functions is the most effective one. But you notice here that there are three questions that we need to answer. First, how do I generate the demand function? Second, how many demand functions to use? And the third, how do I know that one of them correctly represents customer demand? And so uh, first, let me show you how we use the demand function the demand functions that I described. Suppose I generated three demand functions. Our algorithm um, applied in the case of Groupon is very simple. I split the four days into two parts. From zero, from the beginning, until T1 is when I learn, right? And maybe from the beginning until, uh, the, um, until the end of the first day. This is when I learn. And once I decide that I learn enough, I switch to the final price. So how do I decide that I learn enough and what did I learn? The, the algorithm, the technology is extremely simple. We start with an initial learning price, P1. I'll talk about the selection of this price in a second. And we observe sales during the learning period. And then we ask a very simple question. Once we observe sales during the learning period, we ask which of the 30 demand functions closely estimate this level of sales? Suppose this demand function is what I call here demand function I. I treat this demand function as if, as if it was the true demand function. So the algorithm is extremely simple. Observe demand, observe sales during the learning period. Ask at the end of the learning period which demand function is the closest to estimate this level of uh, sales. Uh, this is the demand function that I'm going to use and I'm going to price um, the product based on this uh, demand function. And uh, so uh, um, in the implementation, we applied this learning algorithm. Um, there were a number of business constraints that we had to incorporate in our analysis. One uh, group on told us, uh, look, the initial learning price, you cannot determine it. This is negotiated between Groupon and the vendor. And so this is an input to our algorithm. The second uh, uh, business constraint was um, if your algorithm comes with a recommendation to increase price, don't change the price. If your algorithm comes with a recommendation to decrease price less than 5%, we are not interested. In fact, if your algorithm comes with a recommendation to decrease uh, the price more than 30%, again, there is no interest. So you can see that there is a very small window where we can change the price. The question is, of course, how, what is the impact on bottom line? And they said, um, you know, keep in mind that the merchant gets fixed share. W what does this mean? Look at the, at the um, Japanese restaurant on the right-hand side. Um, you can buy this coupon for 70 bucks and you redeem it at the um, uh, restaurant for 30 bucks. Now, this $17, is split between Groupon and the restaurant, not necessarily equally. Suppose now that uh, our algorithm comes with a recommendation after learning to reduce the price from 17 to 15, right? In this case, the restaurant receives exactly the same amount. So from the restaurant point of view, there is no change in what they receive. And Groupon um, revenue goes down from 7 to $5. And so from the, from the Merchant point of view, reducing the price is, is uh, a, a significant advantage because reducing the price increased traffic to their product, but this is a problem for Groupon. And finally, um, we um, developed this uh, algorithm that allow us to generate uh, demand function for every new deal that the company is uh, selling. We typically generate um, about 90 demand functions and we use them in the learning process. Now you ask yourself, what is the impact of this simple algorithm on performance? 
I'm showing you here a live um, uh, experiment that we have done over a long period of time at Groupon. Um, we tested uh, five different product categories. You can see them at the bottom. Beauty, food and drinks, leisure, service, services, and shopping. Yellow uh, represent booking. This is all the revenue collected by the company independent of whether it stays with Groupon or goes to the merchant, right? And the reason booking was very important is because it's a sign of market share, right? And you can see in booking, we are doing very well. We increase booking for beauty by 140%, for food by 100%, for leisure by 60%, for services by 85%, and for shopping by 300 plus percent. Uh, what is revenue? Revenue is booking minus what was transferred to the merchant, right? So this is what stays with Groupon. This is the impact on their bottom line. You can see we did well in beauty. We did well in uh, food. Um, we are neutral in services. We are doing very well in shopping. Uh, we had a problem in leisure, and so we recommended for Groupon not to use our algorithm for leisure. And the problem with leisure is it's very difficult to scale uh, to scale for the time effect. For example, when I, when I buy a product from Groupon today for a trip, uh, say, to uh, uh, Mexico, um, I plan ahead of time. So the time effect is not uh, easy to incorporate in uh, this product uh, category. And so um, here is what I suggest. Uh, I talked about um, um, forecasting. I talked about um, uh, learning. And I talked about price optimization. Before we switch to the uh, story of B2W, why don't we take a polling question where uh, we will uh, ask you to report your experience about how you are using um, uh, pricing in your organization. So what is the best that describes your organization approach uh, to pricing? And you see here a couple of options, uh, cost plus, like Rulala, focusing on the competition, like what uh, uh, I saw in other companies, focusing on uh, value, uh, maybe using machine learning analytics, like what I described here, or maybe other techniques. Just choose one that best describes your um, company approach to pricing. Okay, I see we are getting the results, so if we can push the results. Um, and uh, in fact, this is very consistent with the experience that we at MIT have had um, over the last, as I mentioned, um, um, four years. Many are just looking at what the competition is doing, right? This is 40%. Um, uh, a quarter are using cost plus. Uh, remember the Ulala story. It's all about cost plus. About 10% or 12% are focusing on analytics for pricing strategy. And this captures mostly what is done in, um, in the market. And so um, let me uh, try to um, close by telling you the story of, uh, of B2W. And so I'm back into the uh, slide. Um, B2W, just very quickly, is one of the large, in fact, the largest online retailer in Latin America. They offer a variety of products from uh, mobile phone to domestic appliances to games to uh, TVs. The company was established in 1999. They are now growing at an amazing rate of 30% per year. Um, they compete with the like of Amazon and Walmart. They have four brands. Um, you can see them here. Shoptime is a brand where they sell through TV channels. So that our algorithm is not incorporated there, but it's incorporated in all the other uh, brands. 
um, you will see what I'm describing here is in, in, in fact a summary of all the techniques that um, I describe for Groupon and Rulala. Uh, we incorporated um, um, effective uh, forecast, uh, regression tree, in fact a, a more uh, sophisticated version of regression tree, learning on the fly and, uh, and optimization. Our technology is uh, integrated with the um, uh, ERP that uh, um, V2W has. We incorporated uh, data in our forecasting on traffic, on competitor price, on discounts, on marketing spend by, um, by B2W, uh, on, on uh, competing products sold by B2W at the same time they are selling a specific product we are focusing on. And so what we are doing, we are using um, the forecast uh, together with learning uh, in order to uh, feed an optimization algorithm that give us uh, prices. Um, our algorithm now runs twice a day, uh, in the morning and in the late afternoon. Uh, typically, it takes traffic information on people logging to their website uh, before we uh, optimize price. Uh, to generate an improved forecast. There is no manual intervention. If you remember, in Rulala, there was a person in the loop. Here, it's all fed straight. It's all pushed directly to the website. Um, and we tested it on uh, and used it on uh, many different products along a, short, uh, a long period of time. I will divide the result into three product clusters. The first is the low price product. Um, Green represents the performance of our algorithm. Blue represents the performance of the control. So we took all low price uh, products, we split them into two groups. The control, they do their own strategy. The treatment, uh, this is our algorithm. And you can see the impact. We increase revenue for low price uh, products by more than 60%. We increase profit by more than 40%. And we increase um, number of units sold, which is a proxy for market share by more than 140%. We then tested it on fast selling product. The results were not as good, but they were great. We increased revenue by 17%. We increased profit by 30%. And we increased uh, units sold uh, by 14%. And the last product category was premium products. Think about premium TV or premium um, uh, uh, mobile phone like smartphones. And, and the, 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 this cluster that I'm going to present was really a very nice uh, experiment because at some point we did not use optimization. And you can see when we did not use optimization, we are not doing well. Control is really killing us. However, as soon as we switch from uh, the method without optimization to incorporating optimization, we are doing extremely well on all the dimensions. Revenue increased by more than 400%. Profit increased by... Uh, about 360% and uh, number of units sold uh, increased significantly. Let me just summarize um, the results by saying that uh, at the end of this uh, field study uh, that was running for a long period of time, um, uh, B2W reported that, that this technology not only helped the company improve revenue, improve profit, and improve market share, but also it had a big impact on the breadth of products that the company is selling. And you can see it in this slide. The X coordinate represent time. The, one, the Y coordinate represents the number of unique SKUs sold. Green represents the, our algorithm. And blue represents the control. And you can see we are selling more unique products than what they used to sell uh, before, which help position the company not only as a better price company, but also as a company that sells a wide variety of, uh, of products. And so let me conclude uh, this discussion with just three observations. Uh, the first is uh, there are new challenges emerging from the online retail space, um, high demand uncertainty, short product life cycle, uh, uh, for, and a lot of time, like in the case of Ulala, limited inventory. The combination of forecasting, learning, and optimization can make a huge impact. 
and what, I'm, what all of us are proud of uh, here at MIT is that these methods are not only supported by nice theory, this is what we are all proud of in general, but also they are supported by practice. And so let me uh, stop uh, here and uh, bring uh, Peter back to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. This has been very fascinating. We have a lot of questions coming in. Let me try to uh, start summarizing some of them. One of the kinds of uh, sets of questions I think has to do with uh, people are very interested in uh, the notion of doing the optimization and, and the learning and a couple of questions about that have to do with you're making a decision about when to learn and when to earn as you, as you put it. Uh, but isn't there a, a, a case that our customers actually learn about that strategy and then start to game us. And so how do you account for that? Oh, very, very good question. In fact, when we implemented the technology at Groupon, that was one of the questions because if you can anticipate what Groupon will be doing, you can behave accordingly to gain the system. So the way we implemented this, um, um, there are two uh, uh, parts to my answer. The way we implemented it uh, was to not implement this strategy for every product. We select randomly a set of products for which we will use this strategy and other products we use just the same fixed price. The second uh, observation is in the case of Groupon, um, the price only goes down. But in general, when we implemented this, like in the case of B2W, price may go up and go down. So even if you time it, you don't know, and I don't know even, whether the algorithm will come back and suggest price goes up or the algorithm will come back and suggest a decrease in price. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard to uh, time your, your behavior and become a strategic consumer. And do you think, by and large, customers understand that that is what's happening? Or in these cases, is there an, is there an advantage in transparency? I, 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 I actually ask that question to many people um, who use Groupon, Rulala, B2W, Nobody can see that. Remember, we are not changing price very frequently. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the key ideas in the case of uh, Groupon was we want to use very few learning prices. Mm -hmm. And we settled on a single uh, learning price. Interesting. Another set of questions have to do with understanding what you mean by competition and what the impacts of competition are. You were talking, I think, about competition between products within the offerings of one particular company who have access to all the data on price, inventory demand, and so forth. But what are the impacts of uh, exogenous? So factors? when we are talking about competition, we refer uh, in different uh, uh, cases to different aspects of competition. In the case of Furulala, competition was internal competition. I'm selling this product. Here are five other products that I'm selling at the same time. They all compete in the same uh, space. In the case of B2W, competition was what is the price that this product is sold by our competitors? Mm -hmm. And so we had an engine searching um, the market in Latin America and identifying what are the available offers. Mm -hmm. So um, part of it, it's internal, and part of it is also external competition. And does pricing behavior from external competitors actually affect the performance of the algorithm? Uh, so so let, let's talk about the algorithm. What affects the performance of the algorithm include uh, traffic, how many clicks we saw uh, in the last two hours, competitor price, big impact on the algorithm because you want to position yourself to uh, compete effectively. What also um, uh, affected the, the algorithm uh, discounts offered by uh, different companies, um, marketing spend by B2W, uh, competing product the B2W sell at the same time they sell this product. All of them were part of the, the, mm -hmm. the algorithm. Very, very interesting. And related to that, you, you know, you very compellingly gave some evidence of what the improved performance was. And we had a lot of questions about, are we sure that this improved profitability when we're optimizing revenue, where we're, are we truly optimizing profitability? But related to that were some interesting questions about, uh, we know that this has worked as a step function from the old pricing strategies. And you talked about the fact that for some products you still keep some of the old pricing strategies in the mix so that you can convince yourselves that, the, that these new ones are working. 
have you run into any issues yet though with kind of that, that baseline of how do you know this is still the optimal approach? Yeah, so um, this is all about learning continuously and we adjust the algorithm and the beauty of this, as I do more events and as I price more product, I have more data that my algorithm can use to improve itself. Um, uh, that was the most important learning from uh, this uh, experiment, that uh, date, historical data plus data that you achieve as you price the product help you improve the strategy as you move forward. Mm -hmm. What kinds of, uh, of, of products can, can, can these techniques be applied to? You know, we have people from service industries who are wondering whether they can use this or software as a service. So um, um, th these techniques are, are very general, right? They have, uh, here we uh, sell uh, physical products like iPhones um, or TVs or appliances. In the case of Groupon, we sell coupons, right? We don't sell any physical products. This is a service industry. Um, in other cases where we work with other companies, it was um, about, for example, um, uh, technology where bundling is very important, right? Mm -hmm. um, I can offer you this product at one price, another product at another price, but if you buy both of them, I can bo uh, give you uh, an, uh, um, an effective mm -hmm. discount. Mm -hmm. And so it's a cross um, uh, product and it's cross industries, but a word of caution, the, the, the technique itself needs to match the specific industry and product characteristics that mm -hmm. we are focusing on. And you notice, the, the, what we did for um, Groupon is slightly different than what we did for Ulala. What we did in the case of B2W is a combination of what we did for both of them. Right, right. So I think what's interesting about that as well is we've had uh, quite a few questions about which essentially uh, are where can we get you know, these kinds of models, how can we learn how to do this? What I think I'm hearing you say is that actually the right question is how do we build the capability to be able to engage in this kind of business analytics? Uh, and it, it isn't just about pricing, it's about business analytics more generally. Uh, so I wonder if you have any, any comments about that. So, so uh, this is raising really a very general issue. How can company become a data-driven company? Right? And this is with respect to revenue, but it's also with respect to, say, risk management, and maybe it's also with respect to supply chain, operations, manufacturing. And so we uh, at MIT uh, did uh, a large uh, study trying to understand, right, what do successful companies do when they use analytics, and can we learn from them? And we found uh, three elements in the way successful companies are using um, analytics in data and analytics in uh, general. First, and this is very similar to what I talked about uh, in the case of Ulala, they use internal data as well as external data. By bringing them together, you can make a bigger impact. Um, the second uh, thing that we found is data is not collected and managed in silos, right? Mm -hmm. Procurement has the same uh, data set that manufacturing has, mm -hmm. that logistics has, that distribution has, that uh, people who do marketing has. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked um, about uh, a year ago with a very large manufacturing uh, company in the U.S., very successful company, successful on technology, not data-driven. One of the problems was very siloed company in terms of where data is. Procurement had a completely different data set than uh, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to make decisions. And the third major difference between those who use analytics successfully and others is that those who use analytics um, uh, successfully, um, in their case, analytics is embedded as part of the decision-making process, mm -hmm. right? This is not a separate function. As you make decisions, you use intuition, you use common sense, but you use also analytics. So am I hearing you correctly saying that uh, the, the, the challenge here for companies is less one of the technical capabilities of engaging in analytics and more one about the management and strategic questions of how to organize and lead the company to be a data-driven company? Exactly. How to become a data-driven company is a critical question for a lot of companies. And, and a little bit more about the framework that I think about, when I think about uh, data and analytics and where companies are, there are lots of talks about analytics. Mm -hmm. But 
not many companies really are using, uh, if I can uh, uh, bring an off-color joke, I always think about, um, about uh, what I hear from companies with respect to data analytics. This is, uh, in some sense, like sex in high school. Everybody talks about this. Nobody's doing anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, people talk, and you see it here. And, and the, the problem in data analytics is different levels of analytics. Um, the lowest level is just looking at historical data, trying to understand what happened, and trying to uh, understand um, why it happened. But um, in, in, in practice, what we want is to predict, and we want to change behavior. And lot, a lot of companies are focusing on, on analytics for that objective. Predict, predicting what will happen and changing behavior as a result. Right. right. So people are interested uh, in, in, in learning more about particularly these management issues as they apply. I think we're showing right now on a slide some of the executive education programs that, uh, that, that you teach in uh, here at MIT, David, and actually there are a number of other uh, upcoming programs and offerings that uh, we, I think we're going to be introducing around analytics at MIT more, more broadly. It's a very important theme. Here, there's also, uh, I think, a lot of further reading that people uh, can do. Uh, and on the next slide, I think we have some books that you've recommended that uh, people might uh, be able to look at. Perhaps while they're just looking at, at those um, on the next slide, then um, one final question for you, David, that I always like to ask in these webinars is, so if there's one thing that you would recommend that the folks that are listening to this webinar today can do when they um, turn away from their computer, go back to their desk, or maybe when they come in tomorrow morning, depending what time zone they're in. What, what would be your advice? Um, think about what I did here. I think the most important thing that companies can do is to ask themselves, what drive a better forecast in my organization? In the case of um, uh, B2W, it was looking at traffic and, and competitor behavior. In the case of Rulala, it was looking at external data like brand reputation. Think about your business, what drives it. And the second uh, thing that you can do, again related to Rulala, uh, remember I started working with Rulala on inventory and all of a sudden it became a project focusing on price. There is a direct relationship between the way you manage inventory and your pricing strategy. Think about this connection. Great. Thank you. Dr. David Semkilevi, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. We're now going to move uh, to the Facebook question and answers portion of today's event. Uh, so thank you all for that were able to join us uh, today from all around the world, and hopefully many of you will be able to uh, continue. We're now just pushing the link to uh, the new browser window for the Facebook chat, and uh, we hope to see many of you there shortly. We hope you found this presentation informative. This concludes our webcast. You may now disconnect.